Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Ecosystems Podcast. Today you're joined with a cast of two. Unfortunately, Will Dorrington, what did he do? Why is he? he I mean, should we should we say Scotland again? Is he in Scotland? He's, he's somewhere in Scotland. I, right, I think right. I, that's where I assume yeah, that's where Will Dorrington Scotland. goes. That's yeah, where he goes. Yeah. That's where he goes. And then Anna, what's happened there? Anna is legitimately, legitimately sick tonight. So she has, she has a note. She's worn out. She, yeah, she's, she's, <laughs> I mean, that's what, that, no, no, that's what happens when you work with Will. I mean, I think that, uh, I think, I think she's just run into the ground. Yeah. Okay. And then what's Mr. Huntingford's excuse? Oh, God only knows. I think it was something like, I'm just slammed, right? Because that is an odd occurrence, a, un- a quite unique occurrence that Chris Huntingford would, would be busy. I heard it was actually that he wanted to get another tattoo and that takes priority for him. Really? It, it, mm. I can only assume he's going to get the tattoo of like the ecosystems cast banner tattooed well, we'll just see where he gets it. I heard it was um, he wants to get the co-pilot logo in full color, emblazoned <laughs> on it. The the original co-pilot before it gets changed, before it goes out of style. Yeah, he he wants it the with the little yellow pre underneath it, P R E, which I think I assume stands for pre-release. That's what it says on the bottom of mine. Or or is it or is it no? It is P R E. I was going to say is it P R O, but it is P R E. Do you think that his his co-pilot logo tattoo is going to be anywhere near his Dataflex Pro tattoo? Mate, it's, it's if, you, definitely, if, you, it, if you get that, you've been around for a while. Uh, I tell you what, it's going to be near is going to be near his uh, fabric tattoo. Right, right. He doesn't have a fabric tattoo, does he? Do, have you not seen it? No, I haven't. That's amazing. He is ahead of the curve, Al Chris. I don't go investigating uh, Chris's Chris's tattoos or his parts, but um, and I'm sure it's come out on some one of the many WhatsApp groups that I have muted. So you know, you lose <laughs> some, lose some. Tell us, dear guest, dear audience, how do you like the 30 minute format? Are you more comfortable with that than our hour and a half type episodes that we're doing in the past? We'd love to hear your feedback, your thoughts on that. I'm modeling today. Do you like that? 90 day mentoring challenge. It's the, the right way around. It's, it's, rever- it's reversed for me. Power platform dynamics. Three, six, okay, it's good. It's good. We, we can see it. Conference season is coming up, so I thought I'd better put a brand on. So, so which ones, uh, which conferences are you, are you ready for? Uh, well, we've got MVP Summit, right? Which is that what, next, next month, a couple of weeks. I have to book for that still. Good God. Oh, man. Well, well, I've, I've booked twice. I've paid for flights <laughs> twice to MVP. I'm, I'm not sh- I, I am straight up. What? So, Why? Well, last year when they first announced the date, right, I was like, I booked it straight away, the flights. And the reason yeah. for this is the year before, they announced it so late that the tickets to fly from New Zealand to Seattle were like in the – a ballpark is seven thousand oh dollars return, right? And it's just that's, that's ridiculous insane. when it's coming out of your own pocket. You know, it's funny. The yep. bigger the yep. organization you work for, the less they want to cover any expenses that they don't consider. Well, you know, the rule of thumb in in the company I work for is that what is the client that you're visiting, right? And right. Uh, and what's the opportunity in the CRM that it's tagged to? You know. Um, and so that kind of didn't fit that. So I was like, I'm doing it on my own bat. Uh, you know, I'll pay for myself to go to MVP summit. And then last week while I was on leave, I came back and, um, I saw an approval for all costs to be met by the big blue brand. And so I went about canceling my personal flights, cost me $150 cancellation fee, but then booking it all through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. just means that I, I, I jump on the corporate insurance that way. I don't, uh, you know, cancel the private uh, insurance cover and whatnot. And, of course, I get the per diems and all that other kind of stuff that goes with it. My bold statement on this is that if you're an MVP 
and you work for an organization, especially a partner, like I get it in customer yeah. land, but if you're an MVP working for a partner and they will not pay for you to travel for your travel to MVP summit, one of two things are the case. Either you need to find a new place to work with people who are going to invest in your learning and your knowledge, or mm -hmm. two, apparently you're not actually that good at your job and they don't think you're worth it. So maybe time for some either introspection or some uh, inspection of wow. your, uh, your working situation. Hard talk from Andrew there. That's the, uh, well, as in, well, normally see, I take that line as well. Um, but it was interesting. I was talking to a, a guy, a consultant, and I think it was the Netherlands just recently working for a partner and the partner had grown over his tenure there. So when he was first there, mm -hmm. he got to go to com yeah. and then we're not talking about MVP. I'm talking about conferences in general, right? And in, in our community, that type of thing. The company he was working for loosely, I think he said maybe 700 staff when, when he joined and he had these benefits in Europe, etc. Now the staff is 4,000 odd and he doesn't get to go to anything because that's not, you know, it's kind of like, this is the policy and you're just one of the millions no. and, and yeah, I'm of the same opinion, time to find a new employer, right? But the, the thing is, is that, as I say, the bigger the company, the harder it is because the policies that they have are just so kind of, you know, when you're working for a company that has over 350,000 employees, they create these mm -hmm. policies that are kind of like, it's like, there's no manager discretion even, right? There's just bang, that's the rule, non-compliant, compliant, you know, do not pass go. It's crazy. So I have a few thoughts on that, but but I will say I, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And I, I so another bold statement, and that is that 100% of all full-time employees at Cloud Lighthouse are getting their MVP summit travel paid for. So that, that is, is amazing. Uh, that, that is, top, that, that's top the notch. case. Those 150 MVPs that are going to be on your crew <laughs> as you scale. Right, exactly. Forever in perpetuity. Is that the correct term? Perpetuity, yes. There you go. You heard it there. Take this to court if you're ever working for Andrew <laughs> in the future. Right, right. Well done, sir. One of the questions that I have been that's top of mind for me in the last week. I've, I've been involved in conversations with field staff in Microsoft across the SEMA region. And one of the, 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 the topics keep coming up is how do you have AI conversations with CTOs, CIOs, and CDOs, Chief Digital Officers, right? So Chief Information Officer, Chief Technology Officer, um, and and um, Chief Digital Officer. And I'm interested to, you know, you've written the white paper recently, which is a brilliant white paper, um, even more so, of course, if Snoop Dogg reads it to you. But that aside... Did, did, did we talk about that? Did we talk we about did, that? We did. We did. We took we did? Okay, a so, past so this, episode. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, right. so, and if anyone's wondering how that comes about, I have a an, an app that I pay for called Speechify Text-to-Speech. And so I can take any document, PDF, et cetera, and it uses AI to speed up. It actually keeps incrementally, just subtly in the background, going faster and faster and faster. You can go, okay... My comprehension just stopped because you're now at 5x the the normal reading speed as an example so it's pretty cool but you can choose actors accents etc you know they've obviously all been paid you know to have their lexicon of their voice or whatever put in there and and it but it's crazy you know when you have business papers read to you by snoop dogg i suddenly like i'm wondering if it would be awesome or just unbearable to listen to this white paper be read to you by C3PO. What yeah. do you think? I'd say, I, I don't like, even I can go, know. I can go either way yeah. on this. Yeah. 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 I got a feeling that CP3 is not in there because Disney would have had to, you know, what's the voice actor that, you know, probably the licensing implications are probably. Of course, of course. So anyway, back to your, back to your CIOs or your. Yeah. Back to, back to the question, right? Is that, and, and and it goes to a further question that that I'm really pondering myself quite a bit, and that 
the world is changing at a phenomenal rate in this era of AI. And I feel that, that some people are going, already, I'm late to the game. I don't know where to start. There's so much content being, every man and his dog is throwing out content there. And, 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 and I say this also about things like Microsoft Learn. Microsoft Learn is like a mega university now. There's stuff on everything, every product, every, well, there's probably 10 things on everything, right? There's, there's multiple versions of, of everything on everything. And do they even agree? Do, the, the open question. Well, this is the thing, right? When software changes at the speed that it changes nowadays, a what was right two weeks ago could be wrong today. And this is the constant thing, you know, I suppose, and, you know, as I say, when we started my IT career, well, products were released once every three years. You didn't have this m massive need to continue to be current as we do today. You know, we've had the Wave 1 release already in the in the the power and the dynamics 365 ecosystems and there's going to be another one and there's you know if it's anything like past there's that's about 800 different changes per year that are mm -hmm. you know being rolled out and so that's a lot to take in and keep across when you're you know consulting at the top end of the game and so my question i suppose is this I think what people are seeking is is a learning path, yeah. which is, okay, so there's a thousand courses out there, but you only need to do this module from that one, that module from that one, that module from that, and, and, and have a curated path. Because I feel that the first lot of stuff that dropped early last year around AI was still a lot around how did we get here? You know, 1960s, yeah. there was, you know, the Turing and and there's all these type of steps up to where we are. And that's all great theory. And if I need to do an exam on the history of AI, awesome. But I need to understand, like, there's, yes, you can do the kind of what's a business perspective of an LLM. Mm -hmm. But the next step is, is that what, what should I be thinking about of any of those C levels? That I just mentioned before. What do I need to be thinking about? What what when I look at my data estate inside my organization and my op and, and my advice to the organization I work for about what should we be doing to and 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 I'm gonna refer back to your paper, not just because, you know, um I think it was awesome and I'm trying to give you airtime for it. That's not the point. Is that <laughs> You know, you talked about this concept of being prepared for the unknown. You do not know what changes are going to come in your industry in the next three, six, nine months. But could you set up, and, and, and it's something my wife and I, Meg, have been talking a lot about, is a mindset. A mindset that prepares you so that you have this kind of idea of whatever comes, you have a model of uh, adjusting to it, learning to it, applying it and therefore when we look at ecosystems of an organization and you know if i think of the power platform what the platform gives you is when that use case comes out of your organization in three months time you've got a way of addressing it without going out to the market and going okay let's do a market scan of what software can do this you've got a platform you've got the yeah. ability to mm -hmm. mold your organization's journey as you need to um because the infrastructure is done you don't have to think about APIs and all that kind of stuff at a very low level because you've made those decisions already. You're now ready to go. We have the data. Let's add the business value by orchestrating this in the right way for staff, customers, etc. I've talked a bit. Andrew, the floor's yours. Answer me. <laughs> yeah. So how many how many episodes do we have to devote mm. to, to this topic? Yeah, like um, how much like we've only got fifteen minutes yeah, left, so Yeah, what's our, what's our what's our timer say? There's your question, you've got fifteen minutes to answer. So obviously there's there's a lot a lot there, and I think my my opinion may have changed several times as you asked the question, you kind of talked through. But interesting mm -hmm. that you are running into this because I had a uh, I had a message uh, last night from one of my one of the organizations I work with where they want to do a leadership upskilling initiative. And they were asking me about, uh, they were asking me about the white paper and they were asking me about some of the other 
sessions that I do and you know, really trying to do exactly as you say, prepare their, their senior leaders to be able to lead knowledgeably in this era. So I, I think with that in mind, one of the things I gave this advice to someone in our community recently, uh, you know, in the industry recently, who he himself is struggling because more of the work he's doing is architectural and it's strategy oriented and it's less hands on keyboard building something. And I said, you know, eventually you're going to get, you get to a point where you have a really hard decision to make, right? If you love building apps or if you love building whatever it is that you've been building, you have to decide, am I going to continue doing this, this thing, or am I going to discover a love for these other things now that you've reached a point like where your level of experience and the knowledge that you've accumulated on starts to unlock, unlock new doors. But if you go down that second path, you have to let some other things go. Like you're not going to have hands on keyboard as frequently, uh, if at all. And some of those skills that you once had, you're going to understand the principles, right? You're going to be grounded in that experience that you have, but you're going to let some other things like the, your, uh, hands on with the latest and greatest technology, you're going to let that, that go to, to some extent. And that's an emotional thing for people. Mm -hmm. Of course, by the time you're a CIO or a CTO or, or a VP or whatever, you, you probably have long ago made that decision, or you probably haven't been terribly effective in your job because you're so in the weeds. But I think that it's illustrative of how fundamentals are important. So I actually, when, if we go back to late 2022, when um, uh, the Microsoft investment in OpenAI uh, was announced and ChatGPT became available, and I personally went through a bit of a phase of, um, of terror, right? <laughs> like wondering, am I, am I done? Do I, do I have the knowledge to, to, to make it and to, to thrive here? And what I found is that a combination of patience, sort of letting the technology and letting the market gestate a little bit and seeing, you know, observing, seeing where things were going to fall and not feeling a need to open my mouth immediately. A combination of that, along with sort of an understanding of the fundamentals around data, and we're talking at an enterprise scale around how, you know, Data plat the data platform works in an enterprise, and how um, you're going back to how applications are modernized. You know these these principles really, excuse me, I think helped me in in due time to overcome that anxiety that I had about am I going to be able to to hack it in this in this in this era? So first and foremost, um, don't feel a need to open your mouth immediately when you see something new. Let it. Let it sink in. This is all new for everyone. Mm. Uh, secondly, immerse yourself in some of the principles um, of how uh, how the data platform works, right? How AI acts on that organizational data, not how do you train the LLM, the large language model on the whole of the internet, right? But how does data actually uh, get or your organizational data that you own? How does that feed an AI workload? Do some reading on on retrieval augmented generation rag, right? Like those are the sorts of principles that I think are very useful for grounding you as the leader or as the aspiring leader um, or as, you know, a, a senior architect or whoever. I don't want to make this just about the CTO or the CIO. Mm, 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 so mm. I think that's really important. And I have some other ideas, but I'll stop and pass it back to you on this. That's brilliant. So, so just one thing you didn't answer. Yeah. You said do some reading on RAG. Where? <laughs> yes. What? What? As uh, in, you know, and 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 the, this is the ask, thing is ask, is that I, I suppose. Co-pilot. Yeah. Yeah. Co ask co-pilot. Bring, bring me the things. Right. Yeah. The thing is, is that I find that, um. As I say, in, in a world where there is so much information, it's hard distilling down to what's the information that I need. Yes. And, and I mean, yes. it's personal to each person, right? It's, that's, uh -huh. it's, it's not like, you know, I use ChatGPT um, 4 
And by the way, I said four on purpose because I keep running into people that are still on 3.5 and wonder why they're getting shit results. Right. And I still, you know, articulating and getting better at prompting. But, you know, the amount of times over the last year I've said to, to, to it, what learning path would you recommend for me? And it just, it doesn't, it doesn't give me something substantial. And uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't give me, like, I don't want to read a deep technical paper on LLMs. I don't, I don't need to go yeah. that deep. That's not the conversations that I'm having. Even vector databases and stuff. Like that. Yeah, I kind of want to know the concept, but I don't need to get down into the details because I'm never going to need to be down in those yeah. type of details and stuff. It's around having th that ability. And, and, you know, my whole career has been built around being able to have business conversations that are grounded in technology, yeah. right? That yeah. are not, and also conveyed in a way that makes nobody feel like they're a num num, you know, listening. Like, I don't want them to feel like, oh, you know, like, so I try to totally remove acronyms from anything I say. Because growing up in the Microsoft world, it is just full of acronyms. And I am surprised. I had it this week. I had an acronym for a particular role in Microsoft that I was interviewing the individual. And when I say interviewing, I was doing what is called research-based interviewing, um, you know, which is a design thinking process. Um, wasn't interviewing them for a, ro a job role. Or so. I was interviewing them about their experiences in, in something. And what I understood as their three-letter acronym meant was totally different. One word I had wrong, and that one word made a quantum leap of difference at understanding and... Um, uh, about what they did and I was just blown away in that I could have stuck with the opening being the three-letter acronym but I chose to write it out and got this cl massive clarification from it and I know I've once again digressed uh, but I'm mean, just saying that you need to be able to give um, business sound business advice in a way that is not technical but it is grounded yeah. in the technology you know and so yeah. how do you and I go back to you know what you know, is, is it books? Is it specific courses? I think there's this gap around business knowledge in the context of AI that the mm -hmm. world needs at the moment. That is, uh, and I'm not talking about like a university degree kind of level. I'm talking about if I could have one hour a day through the business week that I could be improving my AI skills, what should I be spending that AI on? In the context of business, so I'm not talking about private life, etc. But in the context of business, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, first of all, I do want to just briefly interrupt this to say that um, even though there are only two faces on the podcast today, uh, we have been indirectly joined by one of our missing co-hosts because Anna just brought me a glass a of wine. wine. Oh, it very is, nice. It, re recording recording time in. Uh, in the UK is uh, uh, eight o'clock uh, in the evening for us. So it is uh, fair. So, cool. Cheers, Mark. Cheers. Cheers. I'll, I'll, I'll cheers you to my water um, because it's early mo morning for me. I won't belabor this because I don't, I don't want this to be what, what the podcast is about, mm. but very truly part of what you're getting at, right. Is why I wrote the white paper. Right? So without, without saying, though, I'm going to say, if, mm. if you're in this situation, go read that white paper because I spent yeah. many, many hours over mm. a period of months curating a lot of this for you. So go have a look. But I can point you to some specific to some specific sources of information that that I've enjoyed and, and like down to the article um, mm -hmm. and, and that I found really useful. And then some that I've recently sort of been turned on to, though I haven't spent enough time with them. Uh, to be able to tell you if I if I think it's good or or, or bad, yeah. there's a there's a, a absolutely brilliant guy um, working in the on the AI one of the AI product teams at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I believe in um, the cognitive search team, formerly or formerly cognitive search, now yes. uh, Azure AI search. A fellow named Pablo Castro, and he has a piece, and I I linked to it in the white paper from March, 2023. So it's been some time since I read it. I can't quote to you exactly mm -hmm. how current it is, but it was revolutionize your enterprise data with chat GPT, next gen apps with Azure open AI and cognitive search. 
And that was on the Azure AI services blog. And I remember when I mm-hmm. read that, I, I, that was, that was an illuminating piece. And I thought he, he did a great job. So, um, and I thought it spoke to kind of what a little bit about what we're getting. I mean, it was, it was probably more, more technical. Yeah. Right. But it was a piece, a technical piece that spoke to me while I was actually in a role as the CTO yes. of a global company. Yeah. There's that. I also, and this one is, is, is a weird one, maybe if you're really immersed in tech, but I would, I tell people all the time, go subscribe to The Economist, right? Mm -hmm. If the whole of what The Economist is covering is not your uh, cup of tea, right? You're not uh, particularly interested in what's happening uh, socially, politically in various parts of the world. That's just not your interest. That's just Mm -hmm. fine. I find that The Economist has done a really good job over the last year covering AI, and covering what's happening right now in the techno business world, Mm -hmm. just the right level, right? So a few pieces that stick out to me, there was a recent piece that uh, came out too late to uh, make it into Mm -hmm. the the white paper, but it basically looked at, and and this is I think illustrative of the kind of coverage you're gonna get from The Economist, is it looked at the kind of, trends over the last five, 10 years in uh, capital expense, or mm-hmm. as they, you know, as they say in economic CapEx. So yeah. that's an investment that an organization makes in acquiring or building mm-hmm. a thing. And it'll tend to be a one-time investment versus in operational expense or OPEX, which is an ongoing thing. So to put this into IT terms, right, it's sort of the difference of, are we going to implement a piece of software as a part of a project, or are we going to have managed services that, yeah. you know, or, or O&M that will support this long-term? And what the, what the piece did, and I, I really liked it, is it, you know, it identified that actually right now we're still seeing across the global economy. Oh, you got a thumbs up from me because, mm-hmm. yeah, anyway, uh, accidental, but that across the global economy, um, CapEx, that's that initial investment is actually down from what I think most of us and particularly economists who are following the AI Mm -hmm. revolution would have expected and probably certainly down from where it needs to be um, in order to really scale AI across many, many firms across the world, across the economy. But one of the notions that it offered was that as the very nature of IT, as the cloud has changed the very nature of investment patterns in IT, what we may also be seeing is that some of this investment that would have previously been classed as CapEx has now migrated to OpEx. And Mm -hmm. I think if you want an example outside of AI, look at low code, right? It used to be where we would go, we'd say, I'm gonna implement Dynamics and there's gonna be a big expensive project for that, right? But what we now see is that we're, we see smaller teams that cost less to support, but are more of an ongoing thing. Like we say, we're going to be growing this platform over time, not we're going to do this all in a really expensive yeah. uh, big yeah. bang that we class as, as, as um, uh, CapEx. So the reason I bring, bring this up is that that's the type of thinking that you're going to get from yeah. The Economist. It's not super technical, but it does do a nice yeah. job of blending the technology with the business. I like it. Well, Andrew, it's been good talking to you today. We're on time. We will see you on the next one. Give us feedback. Let us know uh, as you're listening to this what you would like us to talk more about, talk less about, whichever you prefer. But uh, we would love your feedback. Ciao for now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.